Hi there, I am Dr. Shafiq Ali, and in this video lecture, I will be talking about ARDS. Uh, so let's preview uh, what's the goal of this lecture. Number one goal is to give you an idea about the presentation, pathophysiology, common investigations, and management of ARDS in a clinical case basis. So we'll kick off with a clinical case and then we'll follow it up with a detailed discussion on ARDS along with the clinical criteria for diagnosis of ARDS. I think it's very important for um, almost all the internal medicine physicians and also for um, anyone who is going to be a respiratory physician. Uh, let's get started with our case. So this is a patient which was 75 years old and he presents to the emergency room with fever, confusion and shortness of breath. He has diabetes mellitus which is controlled with insulin and metformin. On examination, the patient has shortness of breath, the respiratory rate is high and the patient has cyanosis. The saturation is very low which is 80%. There is also tachycardia and the temperature is high. Immediate arterial blood gas shows hypoxemia, which is actually severe. The partial pressure of oxygen is 45, 45 millimeter mercury, which is very low. Although the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is close to normal limit, actually a bit lower, probably due to tachypnea and hyperventilation. As the patient has a severe uh, hypoxemia, probably he has developed um, respiratory failure. That's why the patient is intubated and he is placed on mechanical ventilation. The ventilatory settings are conservative uh, as the tidal volume is low, which is around 360 milliliter. But the FiO2 is uh, kept on in a higher level to 70%. So FiO2 means fraction of inspired oxygen. So it means 70% of oxygen, which is a fairly high amount. And the respiratory rate is set at 14 breaths per minute. The repeat ABG shows minimal improvement. The partial pressure only increased uh, for just five, which is now 50 millimeter mercury. It means the patient is still in respiratory failure. You can say the patient did not respond to the mechanical ventilation as we expected. It means the patient is refractory to the oxygen therapy. The patient also uh, has a fever. That's why we have done some cultures from urine and blood. And the blood culture is positive for E. coli. So the patient actually had a sepsis. The patient did not give any chest pain, did not give any history of chest pain, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, orthopnea, or leg edema. So we are taking this history to exclude any cardiac abnormalities. So let's uh, recap. What's the most likely diagnosis in this patient? If we summarize, the patient has sepsis as evidenced by a positive culture. And the patient has a severe hypoxemia, which did not improve after a very high oxygen concentration, after a very high oxygen therapy. And this actually leads us to think the differential ARDS. ARDS can be said as acute respiratory disease syndrome or the acute word it may be replaced by adult. I think the first one is better. And sometimes it's also called acute lung injury, although this is not well established nowadays. So let's uh, begin the discussion of ARDS. Is it a separate clinical entity? Yes. Is it itself a primary disease? No. ARDS itself is not a disease. It's actually a complication 
which may be due to a pulmonary disease or a systemic disease. Okay, it's a clinical diagnosis based on some clinical criteria as well as some investigation findings. We'll talk about those criteria later. So, what happens in ARDS is a diffuse injury to the pulmonary capillary endothelium. Okay, sorry. What happens in ARDS is a diffuse injury to two structures. One is capillary endothelium of the pulmonary circulation and also alveolar epithelium. And this injury is mainly driven by neutrophil. Uh, for example, uh, there are some systemic conditions such as sepsis. In this patient that you can see the patient had developed a urosepsis which led to a systemic inflammatory response probably with neutrophilia and those neutrophils um, are activated and they are actually sequestered in the pulmonary circulation leading to a neutrophilic alveolitis. Sometimes patients who have had lung disease may also develop ARDS. For instance, the recent crisis of COVID-19 is causing a lot of death because of ARDS. COVID-19 is a viral disease. So there is viral pneumonia, which leads to activation of neutrophils and other inflammatory cells and causing alveolitis. Okay, so if we go into the further pathophysiology, we'll see that as there is activation of neutrophil and release of some cytokines and other inflammatory mediators, there is increased capillary permeability. And the chemical mediators and neutrophil itself can damage the alveolar cells. And whenever there is neutrophils and inflammation, there would be exudation of proteins. So uh, there will be accumulation of a protein-rich fluid within the alveoli. And this fluid creates a layer or a membrane-like layer known as hyaline membrane. And if we summarize the important pathophysiological uh, points, we'll see uh, there is influx of neutrophil, which causes damage to endothelium and alveolar cell, as well as increased permeability, leading to exudation. And this exudate is deposited in the alveolar wall or inside the alveoli and also in the testicium. And whenever you, we damage the alveoli, alveoli contains type 1 as well as type 2 pneumocyte. And we know that type 2 pneumocyte produces surfactant. And surfactant production will be diminished due to alveolar wall damage. So here it's written, impaired surfactant production. And uh, there will also be loss of surfactant because the surfactant is a chemical structure which can be altered by toxins released from inflammatory cells. So there will be loss or deactivation, or inactivation of surfactant. And those two important uh, uh, processes actually leads to alveolar collapse because the alveolar patency is maintained by surfactant. And whenever uh, alveoli doesn't have enough surfactant, it would just collapse because the fluid inside has a very high surface tension, which uh, uh, keeps the alveoli small or shrunk. And alveolar collapse is the key event in ARDS. It's a key event, the most important finding in ARDS. And if alveolar collapse happens uh, throughout an area, a large area of lung, it would lead to atelectasis. Atelectasis is a region of lung field which does not have any air because the alveoli have been collapsed. And if we continue the pathophysiology that there has been an alveolar collapse and whenever there is alveolar collapse, the ventilation is impaired. You don't have enough air in the alveoli. 
and whenever the air is not there we call it intrapulmonary shunting because the blood is shunted through the alveolus because the blood does not get the oxygen it needs from the alveoli as alveoli does not have air so there is intrapulmonary shunting and whenever intrapulmonary shunting happens it leads to a vq or ventilation perfusion mismatch and shunting happens secondary to as we are talking about alveolar collapse which leads to atelectasis and interstitial edema contributes to the uh, decrease in gaseous exchange but mainly we have to remember alveolar collapse is the key pathophysiologic event in ARDS okay and whenever there is uh, intrapulmonary shunting the blood isn't getting enough oxygen so there is hypoxia in the system and there is increase in the uh, alveolar arterial or AA gradient because alveoli, some of the alveoli may still have air but the, but the blood that leaves the lung does not have enough oxygen so there is a difference between alveolar oxygen level and the arterial oxygen level leading to high AA gradient Uh, now let's talk about the causes of ARDS. There are many causes written here. For our case, sepsis is a possible reason. And this is actually the most common risk factor or cause. And the sepsis may occur in any system, commonly pneumonia, urosepsis, and in case of surgical patients, may be on infection. Another possibility is aspiration of gastric contents. Probably if a patient has stroke or other cerebrovascular disease leading to some alteration in consciousness level. Those are the patients who are more likely to be having aspiration and development of aspiration pneumonia. And aspiration pneumonia ultimately leads to ARDS. Severe trauma is also a common cause. Severe trauma is also a common cause and it may be trauma to the lungs, such as lung contusion, or maybe trauma to other parts of the body, maybe head trauma or head injury, etc. Burns, fractures, such as fractures involving large bones or bone areas, pancreatitis, that's an interesting cause because pancreatitis. Um, causes release of pancreatic amylase and lipase in the circulation and amylase and lipase are enzymes that degrade the cell membrane of the alveolar capillary and also the alveolar cells or alveolar pneumocytes leading to ARDS massive transfusion near drowning also important causes and there are some other causes I think uh, they are less important but still um, if you can remember that if you can remember those, it will be helpful in your examination. And now let's talk about the clinical features. Um, in this patient, we had dyspnea, tachypnea, and tachycardia. And all of those happens due to hypoxemia and an increased work of breathing. Why increased work of breathing? Because whenever there is fluid in the alveoli, and in the interstitium the lungs become congested and stiff and it's very hard to expand a lung that has a lot of fluid so there is decrease in the pulmonary compliance leading to an increased work of breathing so it's very hard for someone with ARDS to take a easy breath the breathing becomes heavy and tough the patient also had cyanosis probably due to hypoxemia and if we I mentioned about the lung auscultation findings would have written fine inspiratory crackles due to fluid deposition and this uh, this is more most of most commonly found in the basal zones because the fluid tends to localize in the dependent areas and 
The most important clinical feature is progressive hypoxemia, which does not respond to supplemental oxygen, or we can call it simply a refractory hypoxemia. And the ratio of partial pressure of oxygen with fraction of inspired air is less than 200 millimeter mercury. It's uh, one of the diagnostic criteria. We'll be talking about it in detail in later slides. And uh, for diagnosis of ARDS patients, we uh, can do a lot of investigations. But the most important aim for us is to identify the level of pulmonary edema and the cause. So if a pulmonary edema due to cardiac cause, it's not ARDS. If we cannot find a cardiac source, then probably it is ARDS. So we start the investigations by doing a chest X-ray where we find the features of pulmonary edema. And it is seen as bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. It's very important to remember that the severity of hypoxemia does not always correspond with the extra findings. And patient improvement should not be followed by uh, doing an X-ray. So X-ray cannot show the uh, improvement. Rather, the improvement should be assessed or monitored by an ABG. That's the best assessment method for any patient with ARDS. So here's a chest X-ray in a patient uh, who is suspected to have an ARDS. In this patient, we can see in the lung fields there are, sorry, let's take the pointer again, let's take a pen. Okay. So in this patient, we can see there are multiple areas with haziness. So there are multiple opacities in the right lung field and also in most part, most parts of the left lung field. And the heart seems to be slightly increased. Probably the patient had a supine X-ray. And we know that supine X-ray um, shows the heart to be bigger. Then, uh, so the patient probably does not have cardiomegaly. And in from this X-ray, we just uh, can mention that the patient has developed pulmonary edema. To Distinguish this pulmonary edema as being for ARDS versus for heart failure, we have to do other investigations. We'll talk about those in the next slides. We can also do a CT scan, which should be uh, like this. This patient's CT scan shows this is the front of the chest wall, this is the sternum, this is the heart, so cardiac chambers, red vessels. Uh, sorry, red vessels. This is the aorta and this is the vertebra. Okay, actually, let's go to the lungs. So those are the lung fields, a right lung field and a left lung field. We can see the fronts or anterior parts of the lung fields are uh, almost normal, but the problems are in the posterior parts of the lung field. Probably the patient had a, uh, ARDS, which led to uh, deposition of fluids in the dependent level. So whenever a patient is lying in a supine position, the fluid tends to deposit in the posterior zones or posterior regions of the lung. So the patient has developed edema or atelectasis involving the posterior zones of both lungs. Uh, more prominent in the right side, but also present in the left side. You can see that there is atelectasis involving the posterior zones of uh, both lung fields. Here comes the important investigations, ABG. ABG actually helps us to diagnose and monitor the progress of the disease. And it invariably shows hypoxemia, which does not respond to an increased uh, level of oxygen therapy. And initially, we might uh, see a respiratory alkalosis because of hyperventilation. But in later stages, if the patient does not get a proper treatment, the patient can develop a uh, hypercarbia or hypercapnia and if the patient has a severe infection he or she can develop a metabolic acidosis probably uh, indicating that there has been hypoxia in the systemic level uh, leading to a lactic acidosis which is a type of metabolic acidosis now comes the 
investigation with the highest significance, which actually differentiates ARDS from cardiac failure. Okay, so the pulmonary artery catheter or the swan gons catheter uh, is a procedure by which uh, it, it's a it's a catheter by which we can measure the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So this pulmonary capillary wedge pressure actually reflects the pressure in the left heart, especially in the left atrium, also you can say the left ventricle, and it reflects the left heart pressure. And whenever someone has a heart failure or left heart failure, he must have a very high left heart feeling pressure. But if the heart is doing okay, the cardiac output is normal and the heart is functioning properly with a normal ejection fraction, the feeling pressures in the heart will be normal. Normal. So if the, uh, if the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is low, less than 18, it means the heart is doing okay and ERDS is very likely. But if the PCWP or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is very high, it's more than 18, then we might consider a heart failure. We can say it another way is we get um, heart failure. We might consider heart failure, or we can say cardiogenic pulmonary edema. In that case, the management is totally different. Other investigations may be required, but it depends on the patient's history and the symptoms and signs we find. Here comes the Berlin definition of ARDS. Uh, there are four criteria for this definition. If we want to summarize the criteria, very simple. The condition should be acute. That's why acute respiratory distress syndrome. The condition uh, should have some respiratory problem, obviously. So the chest structure would show bilateral capacities or simply pulmonary edema. So in chest structure, you might find pulmonary edema. But remember, the patient shouldn't have any effusion, no lung collapse, or no nodule. Effusion is very important because patients with heart failure often develop a transudative pearl effusion, which may be bilateral. So if an ARDS suspected patient has an X-ray with effusion, probably you are not dealing with ARDS. Rather, it might be a case of heart failure. And uh, hypoxemia, obviously, hypoxemia, which is refractory. And uh, the Berlin criteria mentions the mildest form of ARDS is when partial pressure of oxygen versus fraction of inspired oxygen ratio less than 300 millimeters mercury or less than 40 kilopascal. That is the minimum criteria of hypoxemia. But from the Oxford Handbook of Medicine, it mentions that it should be less than 200 millimeter mercury. So the Berlin definition is, I think, a broader definition, which also includes the pre ards patients, um, I suppose. So they are trying to categorize the patient from a very early stage. And obviously, the patient should not have any history of, should not have any evidence of heart failure. And the best evidence is pulmonary capillary wedge pressure lower than 18 millimeter mercury. Now, um, let's talk about the management. Uh, there are many parts of management, including respiratory management, fluid management, and other management. Obviously, the respiratory management is the most valuable part of the management, which includes oxygenation. So you have to uh, provide the patient uh, with enough oxygen to keep the saturation more than 90%. But Giving the patient a very high dose of oxygen might be damaging to the lungs because we know that uh, oxygen more than 50% may be toxic to lungs. For early cases of ARDS, we might uh, use a CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, with an oxygen level of 40 to 60%. But most of the cases actually progress to a more severe form and requires mechanical ventilation. One should we uh, consider mechanical ventilation? The answer of this question is when someone has a partial pressure of oxygen less than 55 millimeter mercury or less than 8.3 kilopascal despite having 60% oxygen or 
FiO2 60%. That's the main indication of mechanical ventilation. What's the difference between mechanical ventilation to other patients versus ARDS? The difference is the tidal volume in ARDS is lower. It's around 6 ml per kg. But in patients who have other disease, we might even give someone a 10 ml per kg, even in some cases 15 ml per kg. But in this specific disease, we have to give a low tidal volume, which is around 6 ml per kg. And we add PEEP with it. So PEEP is positive end expiratory pressure. The reason we add PEEP is given here. PEEP increases the lung volume by putting pressure on the alveoli, so preventing the collapse. And sometimes it can open some of the alveoli which have been collapsed for a long time. And by this way, we are expanding the alveoli and preventing and decreasing the intrapulmonary shunting, thereby improving the VQ match. So previously it was a mismatch. So we are trying to match the ventilation with the perfusion, improving oxygenation and probably leading to an improved outcome. Fluid management is obviously important, but not as important as the respiratory management. We have to uh, provide the patient uh, fluid support, but we shouldn't uh, give excessive fluid, which can lead to volume overload, which actually exacerbates the ARDS. That's why we need to monitor the patient's volume status regularly. And the best way to do this is to provide an arterial line, which helps us to monitor the blood pressure. And if we want to monitor the pulmonary capillary waste pressure, we might um, introduce a swan gons catheter, by which we can measure the PCWP. And the aim is to maintain a low normal volume, but we must remember that in sepsis patient, maintaining even a low normal volume might take a lot of fluids. And if the blood pressure is low, and cardiac output is low, we might uh, give inotropes. And the goal capillary waste pressure is around 15 millimeter mercury, not more than that. And there are other parts of the management, including treatment of underlying cause, such as in this case, we have to give IV broad spectrum antibiotics, nutritional support through oral route. The use of steroids are not recommended. There are some complications that might happen. And the ones um, that we fear most is the permanent lung injury, especially happens when someone doesn't get the treatment at a very early period. And this can lead to a lung scarring or honeycombing. And there are complications of mechanical ventilation, especially if we don't control the tidal volume well, or if the PEEP is very high, then it can lead to barotrauma, leading to pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum. Um, and the patient, as the patient has an intubation, the tube can lead to ventilator-associated pneumonia. There are other common uh, uh, complications that might happen with many patients. I think they are less important. Prognosis is uh, actually bad. The mortality is more than 50%. And in some cases, uh, it can reach to about 75%, which means that every three cases out of four would die. It all depends on some factors, including age, cause, and the number of organs involved. And the more, the worse. This, this is the last slide. Thank you very much for watching my video. Please, please like and subscribe to my channel. And if possible, share the video with your friends.